Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll get people situated and we'll let people get situated, but then we can start right away. Yes. Absolutely. Great. Um, so tonight I want to talk about uh, Ladino kind of from the beginning and give you a feel for the language that is now mostly known as Ladino, but over the centuries has had many names, Judeo Espanol being the main one that's also known, just Judeo, Judesmo, Spaniolit, among other names. So I'll talk a little bit about the origins of the language, the way it was challenged by other languages and states in the 19th and 20th centuries, its variations, and I'll share examples of sayings and connect them with stories from Sephardic culture. Finally, I'll introduce you to two sets of vocabulary um, that I find interesting that I collected from archival work. Uh, the first set of words deal with uh, Ashkenazi or Yiddish speaking Jews uh, in Ladino. And the second set is what got uh, top billing for this event, uh, which describes queerness and sexuality. Um, and throughout the talk, feel free to put your questions in the chat. And I'm also happy to share sources on anything I talk about. So feel free to ask about that as well. Um, so I'll start kind of from the beginning uh, of uh, where did Ladino come from? Uh, as you probably already know, the modern Sephardim are, as we are known today, were living in Iberia in medieval times and were expelled from the peninsula in 1492 from Spain, 1496 from Portugal. The expulsion orders from the Catholic monarch led to a large Jewish migration. Some went north to Amsterdam, some west to the Americas, some to Morocco, and a significant part went to the west from the Western Mediterranean to the Eastern. So many who first settled in Italy also kept traveling east, making the Balkans and the Aegean coast really the hub of Sephardic life. Uh, so this whole area. And it really was once they arrived in the cities of the Ottoman Empire that this group created Ladino as we understand it today. Uh, they brought together elements from the different Sephardic dialects they knew. The grammatical language base for Ladino is Hispanic, uh, making it a Romance language. It's already had Hebrew and Aramaic vocabulary. Um, and basically people leaving Iberia and arriving in what became the Ottoman Empire did not already speak a language that we can identify as Ladino, but spoke variations of Hispanic dialects, Castilian, Aragonese, Portuguese. And they also had this base of Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, so they bring that together and we can see this Hispanic Hebrew connection, for example, in a phrase like sin sari sin mal, a very common day-to-day -day phrase for Ladino. Um, and I gave you the English also right there, meaning safe and sound. It was, it's a way of wishing someone a safe journey. Um, and you see the grammatical structure, sin, isin. Um, and without this, without that, it's entirely Hispanic. The second word also, this uh, on the, of the series, mal, also of Spanish origin, but the sar is Hebrew, uh, meaning fear in Latino. So sin sar sin mal, kind of exemplifies this Hispanic Hebrew uh, connection that's made in the language. And basically these are the cities that I would say are the main centers of the creation of this language. You may recognize some of these towers. Um, if you're from the area or have visited, uh, feel free to put in the chat if you have connections to any of these four towers. Um, I'm sure if you're so far, they, you might be connected to at least one of these places, maybe multiple. Um, but that's far from the totality of the language, the Hebrew-Hispanic connection. Ladino, I would say, is a quintessentially Ottoman language, first of all, because it's created in the Ottoman world, but also, in addition to its Hispanic grammar, only around a four estimated 40% of the words are of Hispanic origin. So the rest, some of it comes from Hebrew and Aramaic, but a good part of it is populated by the languages of the Ottoman Empire and international prestige languages of different eras. The local words acquired depend on, of course, location. So you see here the main cultural area um, that I pointed out in more focus. So the four, the four cities, the four towers I talked about were Istanbul, Istanbul's Galata Tower, Izmir's uh, Clock Tower, the White Tower of Salonika, and uh, Saray, Sarajevo was the fourth one. 
um, basically in these four cities and around the cities also in towns, um, we see Turkish across all of them being present as a language of state that affects everyone. So there's loan words from Turkish in all, in all of the areas. Where Greeks are more present, more Greek words are borrowed. And further to the West, more words from Serbo-Croatian we see up here in Ladino. Uh, there's also words that it's going to come up in when we're talking about queerness as well. There's also borrowing from Persian and Arabic that's happening often through Turkish then spans the region as well. And besides this, there's also variations uh, from, lang from place to place on a more grammatical level. For example, speakers in Salonika put an F in front of words that for an Istanbul dialect would just start with a vowel. Uh, avlar versus favlar for talking and Ija versus fija for daughter are simple examples that you could recognize right away if you're talking to a speaker from Salonika versus Istanbul. And in addition to these local influences, the Hispanic lexicon of Ladino is enriched by languages of global commerce. So for the 16th, early 17th century, this is Italian. We see a lot of Italian influence uh, in words like nonno and nonna, referring to grandparents. But then in the 19th century and onwards, especially with the arrival of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which is the network of schools, French plays an extremely large part in changing Ladino. This network of schools was founded by French Jews to educate and enlighten Eastern Jews. Um, and the Alliance also kind of leads me to talking about the decline of the language in a sense, because French not only changes and affects Latino, but it also it replaces it, especially among the elite uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. So the arrival of French as a prestige language makes a dent in speakership, especially among the wealthy. But then we, what follows is the era of nationalism. So after Greece invaded Salonika in 1912, a virtually Jewish majority city at the time, Hellenization becomes the order of the day. And on the other side of the Aegean in Turkey, we see the 1920s and 30s. There's intense pressure on Jews and other minorities to speak Turkish. The Citizens Speak Turkish campaign brought social pressure, fines, and even imprisonment for speaking Ladino in public. Uh, Ladino was not accepted by the government as a language of instruction in Jewish schools, um, and they could no longer teach in French, so instruction automatically flipped to Turkish. Uh, Jewish accents were thought to be tied to Ladino speakership and were an element that elicited constant discrimination and ridicule. This is all 30, 20s, 30s, and into the 50s and 60s. Um, and because of this, uh, because of all these elements, by the 70s, the language of daily use among Jews in Turkey became mostly Turkish. This is true for my family as well. And in Greece and the rest of the Balkans, it really was the Holocaust that fatally wounded the language. So more than 95% of Salonican Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, that really uh, shrinks the language's presence in the Balkans. The Sephardic Jews also moved to Palestine in great numbers in the early 20th century. Um, and those moved later as well, mostly switched to Hebrew. Again, under a strong national expectation to speak the state language. Of course, Ladino today is still very much alive. I wouldn't say it's a dead language at all. Uh, and if anything, it's experiencing a turnaround in the last few years with the increasing popularity of online education talks like this. Um, and we'll see how uh, this turnaround influenced why I went into the archival work that brought up the terms about queerness that I ended up finding. And I'll give one example of a saying that I think encapsulates the sort of uh, Ottoman world uh, that these students of the Alliance, for example, in the early 20th century uh, were, in, were inhabiting. Um, and I'll connect the, the three characters of the phrase to stories as well. So we see, first of all, espantate, uh, beware or be afraid. Espantete um, and there's three characters that one must be afraid of. Un uh, judio rico, a wealthy Jew. Un uh, turco prove, a poor Turk. Un grego borracho and a, and a drunk Greek. So these are the three characters that an Ottoman Jew must fear. Uh, and the speaker then is clearly himself not a rich Jew, but a poor Jew, as most were. 
and he's speaking to someone also uh, who's also a poor Jew to beware first of all of the wealthier Jews um, and I'll give one example of that sort of dynamic playing out um, so for example in 19 in 1877 a large number of Jews were working in a gunpowder factory in Istanbul which went on strike due to a disease that was reaching epidemic levels spreading through the factory. Sound familiar? Uh, workers afraid for their health, organized and refused to go to work, uh, which the state finds unacceptable during, the, during a war because uh, so they, they need more gunpowder. Uh, so they decide to send armed guards to collect the workers from their houses and force them to come back to work. And the Jewish workers in this case are aided in, in this effort of the government by wealthy Jews who pointed out which striking Jewish workers uh, lived where, uh, giving them away. So this experience is the sort of, the sort of thing that this saying encapsulates. Uh, the next figure, the poor Turk, the Turk of Proe, uh, is another figure of danger because he's officially higher status, uh, especially before the Tanzimat era of the late 1900s. Um, thus could feel entitled to anything a Jew has. If an altercation occurs between a Jew and a Turk, authorities are likely to side with the Muslim over the Jew. And the comical ending is the drunk Greek, uh, also fitting, uh, as Greeks and Jews shared many living quarters in towns across the Aegean and in Istanbul. Um, and in the city, uh, Greeks really ran all the mehanes, the restaurants serving mezes and rakke. Uh, and in the areas where Jews lived, young Greek men were famously the neighborhood tough guys, kabadai, as we call them in Turkish. In the late 19th century, these fear-inducing Greeks included Solak Ligor and Odas Alikosti, who were renowned and mentioned the newspapers for uh, striking fear into the hearts of locals, many of which were Jews. Um, so that's the sort of world that creates this language. Um, and before I jump into the words about Ashkenazim and words about queerness, I'll share uh, another set of words um, that all basically mean the same thing. Uh, and maybe some of you can already guess. Um, so Bamiya's okra, uh, Ravano is a turnip, Kalavasa is zucchini, Arvole is a tree, and Lonso is a bear. Um, basically all of these words, uh, essentially are insults for someone being stupid. Uh, and the uh, among these, I think Lonso is the most commonly used um, to this day. Among people who don't speak Ladino day to day, it's still a common word. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that I think the language brings to the present as well. And the, the set of words that I want to look at now basically are the Ladino words, which a larger number, I would say, that describe Ashkenazi Jews. And starting, of course, with Ashkenazis, which is expected. But the others, I think, are way more interesting and tell a story of interaction. And I'll focus on the interaction in the Ottoman sphere, uh, especially after the 19th century. Speakers of Ladino and Yiddish were encountering each other really all over the place. Pogroms in Russia and Romania brought Ashkenazim as refugees to Ottoman port cities. Istanbulism in Thessalonica, basically where the language was strongest. Um, and others came to the same cities uh, in search of economic opportunities. The speakers of the two major Jewish languages also crossed paths in Palestine, where Ladino and Arabic speaking Sephardim were the locals. And kind of on the other side of it, they crossed paths in New York, especially in, in the New World, uh, where the Ashkenazim are settled first and the Sephardim are arriving later. But they also encounter each other in Austria, Bulgaria, Bosnia. Uh, the, so the borderlands between these cultural zones, as well as in France. And here I have a picture of Or Hadash, which is an Ashkenazi synagogue in Istanbul. It's more or less a ruin today, uh, but its Ladino nickname, I think, hits at the largest story. Um, it's not the only Ashkenazi synagogue in Istanbul. Along with the Schneider Temple, uh, or the Temple of the of the tailors, uh, the great and the great synagogue, which is another one. Uh, it's one of three, but Or Hadash is interesting because its members were expelled by the larger congregations um, and had to find their own synagogue. And they were expelled because 
they were Jews affiliated with, se- with the sex trade. Uh, that led to hundreds of Ashkenazi Jews in Istanbul who were active in this business to create their own temple. And that's the building you see here currently without a roof. Uh, that's why the Ladino name for this, uh, for this synagogue was El Cal de los Pesavengos, meaning um, the synagogue of the pimps. Um, I kind of started the story at the end. So I'll come back uh, with the word lehli. So these are the words I'm going to look at in this set. Um, the most common Sephardi phrase for Ashkenazim uh, is lehli, and it has an automatic dismissive posture, I would say. As with many Ladino adjectives, it incorporates the Turkish suffix li, uh, which creates an adjective from a place name, like Rodosli, Edirneli, Izmirli, someone from that place. Uh, Hispanicizing the word, we see it gendered using a feminine a, lehlia, uh, or a pluralized with s, lehlis or lehlias. But then where is leh? Uh, named after the legendary leh, uh, lehistan was a Turkish word for early modern Poland. Uh, modern Turkish has since switched to using the term Polonia. Uh, closer to the English, uh, but Ladino preserved this older form. Uh, however, Lehli doesn't just mean someone from Poland, it really means all Ashkenazi, whether they were Polish, Hungarian, German, Russian, uh, Romanian. So the word groups Ashkenazi from all these other different places under Lehli, and it also has a negative connotation. And especially the association with sex work that I mentioned led the feminine Lehli to take on the meaning of prostitute a definition that even made it to a few dictionaries. So that's a depth of association that existed. Um, and perhaps it was this linkage with the sex trade that inspired the phrase lehli sucio uh, or sucio lehli. Uh, this set phrase is so common that it's the first thing that comes to mind for many speakers of, the, of Ladino today at the mention of the word. Um, it means a uh, dirty, like dirty lehli, but also like dirty as Alehli. Um, the linguist Marie Christine Varol Borns even uses this as an example of a grammatical phenomenon where Ladino speakers like to switch the noun and adjective, uh, making it sucio uh, to use that alone as a way of saying something is very dirty. Um, the other word that I think is interesting is vuzvuz, pluralized often as vuzvuzim, which, will, which is important as well. Um, it's another way of saying Ashkenazim, and it's also derisive or even that it's silly um, because it comes from Yiddish speakers asking vas or vus, uh, meaning what. Uh, so vus vus really puts an emphasis on language difference instead of place of origin, like lehli. Um, and its intention and use is above all comedic. So while lehli is the exonym of choice in Istanbul, it appears that vus vus still existed in Turkey, but was more popular amongst Sephardim in Palestine. Um, and we see people use it even, uh, another hint of it is that it pluralized as vuz uh, kind of shows us that it's often used by bilingual speakers of Hebrew and Ladino more so than, uh, Ladino and Turkish or Greek. Um, and we see it rarely as vuz Um, and we see this pluralization often with Hebrew origin words like hahamim or haverim, meaning friends. Um, but it became so popular in Palestine that Vuzvuzim uh, and Vuzvuz uh, even passed into modern Hebrew as a colloquial way of referring to Yiddish speakers. Um, another similar word is Tudesco, or sometimes Tedesco, uh, once again referring to origin, but instead of Polish, it's German, uh, and it refers to, again, all Ashkenazim. And we see it uh, being popular in Salonika, as recorded by various linguists. And we see it in the memoirs of Elias Kaneti, who's a Sephardi writer from Rusjuk, Bulgaria. And the word is constructed with the suffix esko, which really is a, a suffix just created for comedic purposes. Uh, you can make fun of various languages or identities using this suffix. So if you were to say turkesko, it's just the same as saying turko, but making it funny or like making it derisive or gregesco, meaning Greek, uh, peresco and asnesco, like dogish and donkeyish also, kind of show the versatility of this suffix. 
Um, when talking about Todesco, for example, Canetti recalls his childhood in the early 1900s in Bulgaria, and he says, uh, "Es de buena familia." He's or they're from a good family. Is the opposite uh, of being a Todesco, or so German Ashkenazi. Uh, he says, "Quote with naive arrogance, the Sephardim look down at other Jews." Uh, a word always charged with scorn was Tudesco, meaning a German or Ashkenazi Jew. It would have been unthinkable to marry a Tudesca, a Jewish woman of that background. And among many families that I heard about or knew of in Rustchuk, I cannot recall a single case of such a mixed marriage. It's interesting that he chooses that phrase also, that mixed marriage. Uh, the distance we see in Kanetis Rustchuk is also pr uh, present in a proverb recorded among the Sephardim in Salonika, uh, which I have up here is, Ni ajodul seni tudesco bueno, neither is garlic sweet, nor an Ashkenazi good. Um, the proverb and uh, Kanetti's story, I think, line up. And the proverb could have been used basically to discourage these mixed marriages that he points out never happened. Um, so basically, this set of words, I think, also uh, helps us use archival research as a way to look into the language of the past and what we can understand from words, uh, which is the same methodology I used uh, when I was looking at another set of words um, that I want to introduce you to, which describe queerness. Um, I collected these words from asking first language speakers of the language who are mostly older. Uh, when I asked about uh, words describing queer identities, uh, one of the first examples people mentioned, of course, was the word homosexual. Uh, though this was unanimously marked as a recent borrowing and a polite term that never really saw vernacular use. Uh, so the ones I'm going to focus on today that I have up here are all the other words I encountered besides homosexual, and they're entirely derogatory. The first one I had come across uh, when I was reading the dictionary uh, was the one that sent me on this search. It's the word karucha, uh, which is from Greek origin, a meaning wheel or pulley, um, and a secondary meaning of a homosexual man. Um, the word blando and its diminutive blandico, uh, meaning soft, suggests a slur meant for gay men who act effeminately, uh, similar to a Turkish usage. It's the most straightforward insult of this set, uh, and it's based on a, perform a perceived perf uh, failure to perform proper masculinity. Um, a similar example also is dulce, meaning sweet, also a similar usage. Um, what I was trying to say before about Persian words entering through Turkish, for example, we see here the word kulampara, uh, borrowed by Sephardim from Turkish, uh, is a bit more complex in meaning as well, because it's originally a Persian compound word, golambara, uh, meaning someone who likes boys, uh, but actually it was used specifically in Ladino to describe what we now refer to as a top. Um, and more euphemistically, we see Ladino speakers simply say, as it's popular in Turkish to this day, I would say, um, about a man, ez obicim, uh, embedding a whole Turkish phrase into a Ladino sentence, um, to say he is that way. And that, of course, being uh, non-conforming to sexual expectations of some kind, but also used specifically for men. And many of the Ladino terms I discovered, as you might have noticed already, related to, the ter to themes of circularity. Uh, like in Turkish slang and hand gestures, circle have come to represent queerness in Ladino. Karucha, the wheel or pulley, has this, uh, has this in it. And we see it in a Turkish equivalent as well. Other terms adhering to the circular motif stem from the Arabic numeral for the number five, which you can see here at the bottom, that circle is a five in Arabic script. Um, according to the Latino speakers from Izmir and Istanbul, which is who I uh, was able to talk to, queer men could be called la de cinco, or of the fives, or simply be described as a five, not out of 10, just as a five, es un cinco, uh, so this is more likely a recent coinage. The term can also be expressed in a heavily Turkish inflected este es eski uh, Again, a whole Turkish phrase inserted into Ladino. Uh, this one or this person is an old Turkish five. Old Turkish, of course, is an Arabic script. 
um, used for Ottoman Turkish. And again, the five is the circle. So all these insults bear more than a Turkish, more than a passing resemblance to Turkish ones. Again, about circular things like balls and circ and just the word circle as well. Um, and they also denote this roundness situation. And to understand where this geometric association came from, um, I had to go back and look at uh, Ottoman understanding of sexuality, which according to one scholar was defined not by the gender of one's partner, but by whether or one, by, by, but whether one is being penetrated or it penetrates. Uh, such a perception has endured in Turkish and appears likely to have carried into Ladina and the worldview of the Sephardim. So all the derogatory terms I encountered specifically denote men who are being penetrated, uh, though the usage has shifted over time to fit our contemporary Western understanding of homosexuality, regardless of sexual role. Uh, but how did this idea spawn insults about circles? Uh, we can divine an answer from uh, a book titled Homosexuality in Turkey, Yesterday, Today. It's from 1986, but groundbreaking for its time, for sure. Uh, in the early study, that the author of this book surmises that all these stars basically uh, are literal and refer to the shape of a hole. Um, that seems to be the current consensus of where this has come from. And I want to report also that all the terms I recorded are exclusively reserved for men, which was an interesting discovery of our non-discovery, I would say. Despite repetitive questions, uh, the speakers I talked to insisted that there was simply no term for queerness in women that was uh, used in Ladina. Uh, this might simply result from taboos surrounding fem feminine sexuality more generally, queer or otherwise. But I did come across one word that describes uh, girls who are perceived to be overly masculine, uh, kind of in the vein of the English tomboy or the Turkish erkek fatma. Ladino has uh, ijola, which is the last word I have on this list. Um, basically, it combines the word ija, meaning daughter, with olan, uh, meaning boy, uh, one from Spanish, one from Turkish. And while Ladino may appear mum on female sexuality or homosexuality, it does have this terminology that describes failure in performing proper femininity. Um, but the more rewarding part of this archival work, I think, was the fact that it's a communal enterprise. And I'm sure I'm interested to see what people have to say about them also. If you have comments, uh, mention them in questions. Um, because as I was, as after I did this legwork, basically, to unearth the, these words and share them, I took them on the road uh, in this way of mentioning them at talks and panels and bringing up them on Twitter or in casual conversation. And some of the reactions I got, uh, I think, kind of speak to why the why the work is important. Uh, in the original, after the original piece, uh, I basically put out culo alegre, uh, which is the middle one here, meaning happy ass, uh, as a reclaimable term. But other speakers were like, uh, culo still kind of has this negative association. So why not just alegres, uh, like gay in English? Uh, so it also has that easy access to it as well. Um, so I think that uh, is a way that Ladino speak contemporary Ladino speakers have gone with. Uh, like I've, I think people have picked up on that. Uh, the other reaction that I got that was way more surprising and often moving was that uh, multiple uh, uh, trans Sephardic people reached out to me uh, with their interest in the word Ijola. Um, that they like the gender ambiguity implied by this word, the smashing together of the masculine and feminine that this word has. And a term which I honestly wasn't sure where came under the umbrella that I, that I set out to do, but I'm happy that I included it now. Um, and it really is the one term of this list that doesn't refer explicitly to sexuality, but to gender performance. So it was amazing to see trans people, even if it's, you know, just a few people who reached out, but like grasp onto it so strongly and say that they want to identify with this word and now they use this word. Uh, it really makes the language investigation worth it uh, to me. Um, and I'll stop there and take questions and 
I'm happy to talk about anything I did or didn't mention and uh, happy to hear reactions as well.